guys. Yeah. All right, we're live. <laughs> Hello, Finally. everybody. Welcome to FMA Discussion, episode number 35. Tonight, we are featuring uh, Maestro Felipe Jocano. This is part two. The first part we did last Tuesday, for those who might not have seen it, it's up on the YouTube channel. I highly recommend for those who didn't get to see that to definitely watch that. Um, there was some incredible uh, content there from Maestro. And tonight, we're going to focus on Maestro's contribution to the bladed hand. He's got some show and tell for us. And then we're going to answer some questions that some of the viewers uh, sent in. So all that being said, welcome, Maestro. How are you? Fine. Thanks. I hope we don't get any glitch this time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're going to have to. Uh, yeah. I know. But we're going to, you know, so so we can avoid that as much as humanly possible. I'm just going yeah. to kind of just dive right in. Um, sure. On the bladed hand, I loved your parts in there. I thought they were just so informative and, and all that, yeah. what you're talking about. Um, I thought it was fantastic. So I wanted to cover that uh, with you. All right, initially. sure. So sure. one of the parts that you were going on, which I thought was just fascinating, because I had heard pieces of this before as far as when the belts came into play and the more organization into FMA, it sounds like from maybe perhaps a Japanese influence post-World War II. Can you, um, can you take us through that for the viewers and me and, and your findings from that? Oh, sure. All right. Uh, the influence, well, what, this is one of the common questions. Does FMA ever use belts? And the answer is, well, the belt ranking system was adapted from the Japanese martial arts and it was more prominent after World War II, right? Now, I've got to understand, too, um, the Japanese had been here even during the uh, latter part of the Spanish occupation when the Spain uh, opened up Manila to international trade. They were here during the American uh, occupation period, right? Now, um, as far as I can tell, based at least on a single, well, this was an interesting archival photograph shown to me by a military he had he found this archive in the museum in a congressional and wait a library of congress i think archive it's online it showed the picture of an american soldier during the battle for manila he was crouching on a wall and behind him was a sign that clearly pointed upstairs it simply said karate up going on ah, upstairs. Okay, so, okay, so that early, okay. Yeah. That uh, what I am know what I know is um, judo was very popular in the post war period. Okay. And it's from judo that you find the first influence of the use of the belt uh, ranks. Um in the documents from my old system, when it had an organization, okay, it clearly specified in its constitution that there were going to be three, white, brown, and black belt, right? Okay. Now, as far as I know, in the judo was organized along those lines. Uh, that would have been, I think, even during the 20th century and well into the post-World War II era, it was still white, brown, black. Okay? And well, the rationale of the belt ranking system was simply for the founder, Dr. Kano Jigoro, to distinguish who was the who had who was the absolute novice, who was going through the journeyman stage, who had completed the beginning tra uh, level training. And that was what black belt really meant originally. You were a full member of the dojo when you got your black belt because you had completed the entry level requirements. Then you learned the art as it was supposed to be taught. Well, naturally, karate people borrowed that back in Okinawa and in Japan. They thought it was a good idea too. 
and they were looking to expand their influence overseas when the American service people had come over, managed to break some of the language and cultural barriers and started learning uh, karate and judo and brought them back to the US. Now, over here, what did this belt structures also represent? Well, it was a organized structure. There's a hierarchy, there's an organized structure, all right? And it was a way to break down the succession of training. So, you know, it makes sense to actually bring it into something that's very formally informal and family oriented, like in Filipino martial arts. And so, especially in the post World War II era, karate, uh, especially the influence of Shotokan, the, J the JKA brand of Shotokan had all of these colored intermediate ranks in between, right? So they started adding these. And actually, a lot of people are hesitant to admit it, but actually that's purely commercial at the time, all right? Mm -hmm. So this the breaking down, uh, it, it made sense teaching-wise, you break down a cut, the, the, you know, you require a kata for one belt and the demonstration of the, uh, applications and the ability to spar and it gets more complex as you go up okay but the commercial potential was of course right there you know and a lot of instructors uh decided okay this is what you would charge for belt level going up and, and so on and so forth ah okay okay now um again that model that business model was also transplanted into fma so now you also have what is essentially a very informal family-oriented art being gradually modified and taught to a wider base of students, many of whom may not even know each other, but they all know the teacher. And this is where you see the idea of you know, the FMA organizations begin to grow from this point onward, right? Normally, it would have been taught from people who knew the master and it was taught by recommendation. I went through that process. I was recommended to be taught to, I was recommended to Mang Tony. I was recommended oh, okay. to Guru Elmer. Okay. I went through that process myself. But you contrast that to at least one gym I visited in Kubao, the district in Quezon City, where there was a sign, there was signage on the door and on the wall, right? And I found that address from a public magazine. You see, you, you, you see the contrast, the old and the new? Yeah, yeah, in the yeah, old yeah. way, the old way you were referred to the maestro in the new way. Uh, you found the gym by searching through the public pages. Right, right, yeah. See, back in the 1980s, I tried looking for uh, commercial gyms. Now, in our Filipino yellow pages here in Manila, they had only one mention. So I called up the number and tried going there. And there's just one. There was actually a livelier FMA scene going on but you don't know about it unless somebody vouched for you and they suddenly when you were in it's like it's a whole totally different world that people knew ah, each other even that's a an attempt to bring it to wider public consciousness has accelerated 21st century but then so the system is connected to that because this attempts to make it like uh, karate in its organization, right? And judo. So the old FMA masters, especially in the post-World War II era, were also exposed to karate and judo. And uh, some of them decided this would be a good idea to add to uh our styles because they supplemented and complemented some of those things. Okay. For example, okay. in in the Caniete, in Kakoy Caniete's book on Doce Pares Escrima, I think I, I think they still reprint that or republish that and it's you can buy that online. 
you'll find there his transition to his art, which he calls Escrido, yes, which yes. he said was combination scream and judo. Okay. Well, and it's a beautiful uh, combination because you have the 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 crossing hands that's from the spada idaga pattern, but the potential to turn that, you know, when you close the fist and grab his limb, grab his neck, grab whatever, and throw him, it's right there. See, okay. the Cañete brothers uh, also explored these arts, and some of them got black belts too. But they've always been escrimadors. You mm. see, this early part in FMA history, they saw the value, they, they and the other uh, Arnisadors saw the value of having a ranking system to distinguish who had achieved what. And they also saw the value of the techniques that would complement the empty hand part. So last time I mentioned, you know, empty hand techniques have always been backups. Not necessarily main things, but backups. So you know, right, if you right. want, if you want to make a living in the boxing ring, then you go do boxing. Hmm? Mm. Many, many escrimador or anisador, a familiar I meet today here, also spend some time do doing their own fair share of empty hand techniques just to make sure that they don't get left behind. But um, let me see. My maestro Elmer uh, loved boxing. And then when we found a gym in Manila, this was the old L&M gym. He brought all of us to join him. And uh, after our Saturday sessions and training, uh, extend another hour because we're going to L&M and do some more boxing. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so okay. Can you imagine that? Uh, that would have been heaven huh, back then. Uh, yeah. martial arts the whole day <laughs> yeah 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 so that's why the influence of the belt ranks com comes in from karate and judo that was the early template second it was an obvious model to create a method for knowing who learned what and who could be taught what okay the the, the thing is here there are some problems that came along the way here is a hierarchy that's Confucian based. It's borrowed from Okinawa and uh, Japan. Here is a hierarchy that's more family based. This one is more formal authority. This one yeah, is more yeah. informal authority. Put them together and sooner or later, some cracks begin showing up in the formal structure, right? Um, those things are part and parcel of it, the practice until people can find a way to use this structure without having to compromise this one. Okay, so, okay. So one of the problems that caused was, I think the reason why my Guru Elmer decided to forego using belts in his, when he taught his own version or his own brand of uh, lightning and decided to go for certificates and maybe the only sh difference between instructor and uh, student was in the color of the t-shirt white for the students black for the teacher oh, the and that's okay, it okay. yeah that's it ah. that's it that's the only difference that's the only thing that uh, made the difference and you know there's a lot of experiments going on uh, during those times Okay. So when so you say you like during, I'm sorry, when you say during those times, is this like yeah. 50s, 60s, 70s, post World War II? Yes, post World okay. War II. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That was a post World War II. Then, of course, uh, I mentioned in the bladed hand the influence of one of uh, FMA's icons, and that's Remy Presas. Mm. Okay. The Presses brothers, he and Ernie, perhaps were the ones that they innovated in this area, using a standardized uniform, okay, modifying the Okinawan gi, karate gi, to make it shorter and more adapted to a tropical climate like ours. And then the other one was putting the knot on the... If you if ever noticed, why is it that uh, the... People from modern Arnis, when they wear that shortened gi-type uniform, 
and when they wear their belts, they always tie the knot on the side, never in front, right? I never noticed that. Wow. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. All right now, the the belt was of course borrowed from the Japanese idea, but um, in an older tradition, you tie the knot on the side, and that's actually that's the older Okinawan way of doing things. And even wow. then when they were tying the belts um normally the sash or the belt was what was a lot wider it resembled more the ones used in the chinese martial arts systems oh is okay? that okay, okay okay yeah so there is a photograph of kara of shotokan's founder funakoshi sensei with him his belt is tied on the side his students belts are tied in front that's a very interesting confluence old and new okay so tie the belt on the side to make it distinct once more again from the japanese and okinawan uh, ways of doing things many other fma organizations went along with the trend and borrowed the idea too okay so in the belt ranking systems in FMA today, many people will do that. Normally, in the old way, if you tied it on the right side, that was the student. If you tied it on the left, that was the teacher. But if you tied it in the front, now that was the master, the teacher of the teachers. Oh, That's the old okay. way. Nowadays, everybody ties it in front. In the, in the FMA okay. world, yeah, in the FMA world, they tie it on the side um our old well you know my old organization uh adapted that pattern too uh grandmaster ben uh did that pattern uh adapted that idea too so there are photographs of him with his white uh uniform okay white shirt and pants and the knot with his uh belt as grandmaster status tied on the side on the on his right side Okay. okay there and actually um when you think about it tying it on the side makes sense for some at least because then if you were right-handed you put your secondary weapon on your left side mm. right you hold the primary weapon here you know yeah, yeah 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 it makes sense that way but remember again this is a recreation of an older cultural practice and the way of doing it has also changed as much nowadays if you want a backup weapon you don't go reach to your side you just reach in your back pocket <laughs> yeah yeah right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah so the precious brothers adopted it and the many fma organizations followed their lead too right and then many others decided to branch out and do their own thing and do their own twist on putting the belt ranking system okay. so in effect wow. um it's been indigenized again uh it's it's an idea it was borrowed because it made sense to those who were using it and then over time uh the belt systems of each organization acquired their own meanings there's one if they everybody if the guys who are watching this have read mark wiley's uh martial culture yeah, and yeah. Some of the relationships in the use right they have their own names for each of the belt systems and their own ranks so you know the ideas keep floating around and then people take the template and put their own twist on it to make a clear distinction and in the process if it jumps across cultures it becomes indigenized yeah okay okay so mm -hmm. is it fair um it sounds like like uh, as far as historically speaking was dose Perry's maybe one of the first ones to incorporate belts but maybe the priestess brothers took it a notch further is that or could be simultaneous development that's an area those details are something i'm you know trying to look into because the only material you can work with are the publications of the masters of course mm -hmm. kakoi's book and dose pares and of course uh rainy Press's books also right, right. both were published near the same 
right? Uh, the earliest book that we have know of, Placido Yambao's Karunungan sa Larong Arnis, or the knowledge of how to play Arnis, doesn't mention any system. Huh. This hierarchy of knowledge are super patterns from Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. okay, you're back. Okay, good, good, good. Okay. All right. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Ah. Dean, yeah. uh, I think you froze for a moment. <laughs> no, no, I was just no, I was just standing still. <laughs> no, no, no. No, we're good. I can hear you and see you. We're fine. Uh oh. Can't hear you. Oh no, here we go again. <laughs> oh no, you can't hear me? Oh boy. Uh we need Okay, to... here we go. I can hear you now. Oh, okay. Good, 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 good. Okay. Great. So we were on, basically you were alluding to that early book and how there was no uh, language there as far as like organization or anything, if I recall correctly. Okay. Can you hear me okay still? Uh oh. I can hear you. Yeah, folks who are watching, this is I'm afraid of um, his internet connection. No, I can hear you now. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Um, far as that, again, I, you know, when I was watching that on the blade of hand, I just found your commentary just. It was so informative and all that. When you, I guess my next question, kind of part two to this is, overall, and I know there's opinions are going to be all over the place and all that, and I and all that. But what do you overall do you think it had mostly a benefits as far as incorporating some of that stuff from the Japanese? I, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? Sure. I lost the question. It garbled, it garbled. Sure, sure. Yeah. I guess uh, with respects to it, taking the belt system and the organization, the structure from the Japanese, do you think there was overall benefits to that for the com for the FMA community there? Well, um, when you're building an organization and sharing it to the world, then yes. You see, uh, inevitably, when you get to develop okay let's say you're the teacher you develop a cadre of people who are close to you eventually they'll be teachers themselves soon like i know the personal stories of some of my friends in the fma world um usually they started early maybe high school or college after college they go off to work at the same time that they were already about to graduate from their own uh, study of the FMA, from their master. So what happens is he'll tell them, okay, when you, if you move to another place to do work, start a club, he uh, gives them a commission. Okay. So you need a formal recognition, a formal mm -hmm. belt testing, an awarding for certificate, and the student, is now an, a teacher of the art and he's been empowered now when it's handled you know when, when when relationships are maintained smoothly it's an empowering way to build organization and to get your style and your knowledge spread out now if you're building the organization and if you're looking to teach as many people as possible that's fine 
Yeah. Um, it can be done for a profit or non-profit manner. I know I've seen this also from one of my friends. Um, he just trained his students hard and when they were ready to go, he would empower them. He gave them certificates. He just made sure that they had the uh, what was needed to be an instructor. And now he has branches in several locations in Mindanao and in the Visayas. Okay. And, okay. And, uh, and now already abroad in the U.S. and in Korea, right? When it's handled well and the relationships are smooth with everybody, it, it can work very well. Okay. But when sometimes, though, as one of my friends narrated to me, sometimes when the commercial side comes in, then there are some students who make an offer, look, Master, um, I'll build your organization here. I'll take care of this for you, and then we'll collect fees. So I would tell him, you know, that last part is the red flag. I mean, just how much have yeah. you trusted the student with you? Because then the most instructors and organizations I've been in contact with, uh, eventually there's a problem now with uh, in that area. So, uh, okay, <laughs> that's going to be an issue, obviously. So some of my friends avoided having any formal type organization okay. entirely, okay? They, they went as far as the intellectual property protection of their logos and names, but the formal corporate type organization, after having seen everybody else's experience, no, 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 not anymore, mm -hmm. nada. Right, they'd rather keep it small and informal, yeah. Um, but I, knowing how popular they are, inevitably getting it to be more formalized is going to happen. But then, just on their own terms, they must have the sense of camaraderie, brotherhood, and sisterhood that went along with it. So right. they control the size and the spread and the growth of the association instead of it going away. So, you know, um, it has its good and bad points. It's not an absolute answer, mm. but a lot depends on the people who are running it and those, both those who lead and those who follow. It usually ends up like this, a management issue. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. So... Um, before I, I get to the second part, and that was, thank you, uh, that was fascinating. I uh, just want to say some people, just say yeah. hello to some people. Ryan Cordero. Um, hi, Ryan. Thank you. Richard Pacman. Hey, Rich. And Tom, Tom Edison Pena. Thank you. Uh, right. they're, saying oh. hello. they're saying hello, Maestro. Oh, hi. And Andres oh, hi to Mitterdi. them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, Ryan, Richard. Yeah, Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> So, All right. Hey, guys. <laughs> um, Ryan, Richard, Tom, Andres. Yeah. Yes. And uh, we got... So, um, what... Okay, I guess... So, you, you reveal the positive, obviously, like oh. the benefits from being more organized, structured, belts, what have you. Were the pure... Was there negativity right. from the quote-unquote purist, so to speak? Negativity from purists. Um, you know, that didn't. What, what do you mean? Uh, criticizing the belt structure? Yeah, that influence from another uh, country, I guess. Well, there were some who thought that it was cumbersome. Uh, the, sorry, could you run the question with me again? I, I sure. No, no, no. From... Yeah, yeah, no problem. I guess what I'm asking, yeah, we, you know, we went over the positives. What it did oh, for FMA. Who's, uh, okay. You know, okay. Could you run the question? Yeah. Could you sure. run the question by me again about the negativity part? Because I lost the audio for a moment here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. End. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I guess All my right. question uh, is, we went over the positives, but was there any negative outlook from the, uh, you know, lack of a better term, the purist who, you know, didn't want that influence? Oh. Okay. The criticism of the belt structure and the organization. That, yeah, I guess. Sure. It? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, 
Guru Elmer wasn't comfortable with having belt ranks, right? He was teaching us on a personal basis. He just wanted to train, build a country. He felt that the sometimes the negative, the negative part of this that it became an obsession for some people to have a rank, uh, what rank is next, and so on. And in my conversations with some of the next generation of teachers who came after his generation and from other styles too, I saw this happening. People were obsessed with the titles, especially with the instructor ranks. Mm. You know, uh, instructor, guru, master, grandmaster, yeah. supreme grandmaster. Supreme so grandmaster. among me and my, you know, you know, it, it's now creating all sorts of jokes about uh, super supreme grandmaster with extra cheese. All right, <laughs> they do that all the time because the the unfortunate part was the grandmaster title sounds nice, but um, unless it's handled with caution, right? Mm -hmm. Unless it's handled with caution, it becomes ridiculous. So, for instance, I wouldn't hesitate calling a senior practitioner of the FMA a GM, a grandmaster. Why? Right? But uh, he's older than me, and his skill you can't deny that. I'd call him GM. If he didn't want to be called GM, yeah, I, you know, I'd still call him GM. <laughs> but there are some of those, the, the bigger problem comes with those who come a bit younger than these guys are. And the character wise, the it's a, it's a bit off. Okay. Uh, now, see what I mean? So with uh, Master Elmer, all right when we started uh with this teaching we were all at a loss to what to call him because we all wanted to be have a formal title for him now that's pretty funny isn't it it's the students who want to call their teacher yeah a title. right that's As us to yeah. the teacher actually wanting to be labeled right uh, that's the that's where this one is okay so okay. we he said i said no just call me elmer and he said, mm. you know, and since I was the one who introduced this guy, I said, but what do we do? Let's just call him Guru. <coughs> so he said, just call me Elmer. <laughs> yes, Guru. No, 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 no. Call me Elmer. Yes, Guru. Oh, shit. <laughs> and it started from there. Yeah. It started from there. We were the ones who wanted to call him Guru. He wanted us to call him by his first name. This is first name. And it's a very yeah. different yeah. change. Um, so <laughs> that's how it is with many of the older generation. Yeah, yeah. It's the I, ones. I didn't want those Sorry, I, I, I lost a question there a bit. Wow. Oh yeah, no, it did. Thank you, thank you. Um, just yeah. okay. Back, back to the blade of hand because I do. We do got some questions. Right, right. I, I want to get answered. Um, the big one. Um, yeah. And I'm not saying anybody. I'm not. I don't want to make this a generalization, but the Spanish influence oh. can't be denied, right? Right. Okay. Yes. Right. Oh, wait. Uh, Dean, could you re repeat that? It the that last part got lost because the audio garbled again. Oh um, yeah, sure, sure. Could you repeat the last part of your question, yeah, please? So the, the other part of the bladed hand. I saw you covered, which I found fascinating, was uh -huh. you talking about the Spanish influence. Right. And, it can't be denied. Right. Yeah. And um, and I guess there's some that, you know, just in conversations, don't really want, I shouldn't say, I don't want to say not accept it, or maybe not realize how much the influence is there. Yes. All right. So, so can, you, can you speak on that? Okay, sure. Um, first, on the external side, okay, um, there is a the counting system for most eskrima, mm -hmm. the old school eskrima systems. Okay, uno, uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco. You know, um, the fact that's one. Second, many of the terminology and postures are at variations. Usually, 
Tagalog or Bisaya pronunciations of Spanish terminology. Some of it's garbled. And, you know, um, some Spanish-speaking friends that I have said, oh, well, that originally means something in here in Espanol. And said, okay, so we got to talking about which brand of Espanol they spoke. And um, it's very interesting. Maybe it's not Castilian Espanol of the Mexico version of Espanol. Okay, so language speaking wise, uh, a lot of our Spanish influences were filtered through Mexico. It makes sense because of the point to point here was the galleon trade from here to Acapulco. Okay, our contact with Spain was mediated from the galleon trade from here to Acapulco. Oh, how fascinating! Oh my god, yeah. oh, wow. now interestingly. Uh, one of my friends, Matt Galas, was doing some research in the Biblioteca Nacional in Mexico City, and he came across some interesting documents, a certificate, for, for example, from a maestro del Esgrima. See, uh, the word Esgrima in that context in the 17th, 18th centuries, and even the 16th, meant a different thing from Esgrima that we think of today. When you think of Eskrima as swordplay, most people translate it as fencing, which brings a popular image, Olympic-style fencing. Okay, But the Eskrima yeah. from that period yeah. was a more comprehensive body of knowledge. Why? Well, it was, think of it this way, a comprehensive body of knowledge that featured empty hand, well, sorry, weapon combat, sword, sword versus sword. Right? That's the Esgrima, Esgrimir, fencing, uh, Esgrima y Rondalia, the light shield, okay, the pike, the long pike, and then including firearms. Yes, musketry was also, firearms were a common part, part of the package. Empty hand fighting, oh, wow. empty hand fighting, boxing, the equivalent of boxing and wrestling. And from some of the old manuals from the European and the Spanish traditions, uh, many of these things would resemble today's MMA with less restrictions. Wow. That is take so a look at Yeah, boxing and wrestling. And boxing and wrestling was more all out combat. Okay. For the German and English traditions, there were even rules for settling disputes and dueling. Okay, that was part of the fighting handbooks, the military literature of the time. Mm. Right. So this man was given a commission as the Maestro del Esgrima for Manila and the surrounding cities. And then after that, uh, after he spent, where did he learn his fencing from? Well, some of the Spanish maestros had transplanted an acad Academia del Esgrima for the benefit of the, the Spaniards who were also transplanted there. And he's created an Academia del Esgrima and he was given a certificate of accomplishment. He graduated from the training. The certification John, in the translation from the Espanol, was a testament by a, another city official. He examined the man and found him to be competent in the various forms of Esgrima. So you could imagine what his testing was like. Mm, uh, well, fence, the, the fencing, yes. The weaponry, different types of swords, the buckler, the shield, the pipe, empty hand combat, theory, tactics, whatever. Right? Yeah. Now, the apparently, we have no other knowledge of this man's other work except for this manuscript because my friend was still working on translation of some of the other documents that he found there. And we we're waiting for it. Right? But that alone makes you think all right, what else traveled from Mexico to here? Who else was going back and forth? We're That's always right. making a big deal about researching the Spanish influences in the continental libraries. Uh, Barcelona, Sevilla, the first point in the voyage, okay, in the trade from Spain to Philippines was in Acapulco. 
I'm sure that we're a lot of us are certain that many of these documents would be there in the Biblioteca Nacional in Mexico City, and it just awaits time and effort, you know, from historians who's willing to look into the military wow. side of the Congress. That now, is so and fascinating. I, like nobody and you thought, for like that Mexico to happen, City. yes, because then for that to happen. You'd have to have people who are well versed in Espanol, both the spoken and the written, and mm. who can take a look at you know some of the written versions of Espanol and maybe the differences in the vocabulary that's crept in since then. If now you're going to look into the military science aspect of this, they'd have to be familiar with the military arts, the warfare of the period and the military terminology you'd at least have an idea of what you're looking for you see and this is something that most people don't really appreciate how what kind of background knowledge do you need in order to do the research of this sort one of my friends is a history professor now in uh, university of the visayas in Miagao, in Ilo. he did his work in Cambridge, PhD in history, and his focus was on Filipino martial arts, okay? And um, what he did was the more contemporary versions of this. And, you know, to do that, you need you uh, of some of the hierarchies, organizations where they to arrive at something coherent. There you go. Now, Spanish influence, terminology, what else? Um, well, look at the diagramming system of most FMA styles. Have you noticed that there's always those four intersecting lines that make it like an intersecting set of cuts? Okay, if you're talking about strikes or cuts, the most common patterns are, <coughs> excuse me, eight or else 12. So you're saying if that you talk maybe... about eight, for instance, uh, put them on the floor. And you have okay. had that eight uh, stepping pattern on the floor, right? And oh, it teach okay. you eight okay. different ways of dodging an attack while getting to a position to launch a simultaneous attack of your own, right? Mm -hmm. Now, um, eight directions. In some of the older manuscripts from the European manuals, the eight directions uh, pattern is supposed to be painted on the wall and the fencer is supposed to be able to either cut or land a thrust along designated points within that eight pointed circle oh wow okay now if you put that on the ground then you teach maneuver now that becomes very much more sophisticated mm. Mantoni told me um that some european some italian yes i think they were italian fma practitioners had visited him and when they were exposed to the system they were amazed maestro they said to him you know this system that you Elements that's not only we're seeing it it's coming up. I like studied also the other side, like lightning, for instance. You have uh, the basic Excuse me, of the sorry, maestro? Okay. Excuse me, maestro. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. There was a part there where you, you kind of cut off. Um, oh. So the Italian, the Italian students came to visit yeah. Montoni, and they saw a correlation. So, so your. Yes. And then, can you hear me now? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yep. All right. All right. And they were fascinated because they saw something in the Illusistimo system that they said, look, Maestro, this this is no longer as widely practiced in Europe as it used to be, and we're seeing it alive here. 
See? Isn't that something? Yes. Wow. So there's a Euro that European influence and uh, is right there. Look, the basic postures that all Escrimadors know. Abierta, cerrada, right? Mm, mm. This is open and this is closed. Abierto, abierta, sarado in Tagalog, cerrada in Espanol, yeah. right? I know that in the U.S. there's a system that's based upon the concept of closed, the, the word closed, cerrada, pa, 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 to close. Wow. Uh, that's another terminology. In the system, uh, names of the names are from Spanish, Agulo, Pancada, which is the vest which go upward, etc. So the system in all and again the style of movement, for example, and which is borrowed from fencing. Yeah. But not fencing yeah. in the sense of European fencing back and forth, but the old school combative fencing for the battlefield or for the duel. That depends on the use for which you have it. So <clears throat> there's a lot of influence, but the thing you can say here is since the original weapons were longer, rapier yeah. and dagger, these techniques were shorter, right? Heavy also, but these are shorter specialized weapons as well. Okay. Among the Visayan and as well as Tagalogs, that you know, systems that I, mm. people that I've met, huh? there's. Uh, you, you you distinguish bladed tools by the following. One would they say uh -oh. oh man, I wouldn't lose them. This stuff is just getting too good. And you know, you, you, okay. you generally get the idea. One for fighting, one for farming. Okay, yeah, but I've heard okay. Yeah. Now um let's see, where else do we find the Influences of Espanol. The most common term, espada y daga. Yeah, See? right. Yep. That pattern of movement, espada mm. y daga, sword and dagger. Mm. Or as uh, some versions, if you have a stick, baston y daga. Okay, fine. So that one is a giveaway, the, the terminal is a giveaway. Yeah. So what happened and how did the Spanish influence come so, to play a role so deeply into the embedded into FMA? Well, um, work on this that you can explain why the Spanish influence was so deep. Uh, one of, well, two people I know, and my other friend, Tini Bacachor, published a book there called Stefano Esquima, Beyond the Myths, right? Okay. The research focus was documentary, and they focused upon the Eskrima of Cebu, right? Now, what they did was to look at the background information on Cebuano history, right? And in looking at Cebuano or Cebuano history, um, the documentary sources that they consulted were that immense compendium, 50 plus books by Blair and Robertson, okay? Again, for the audience there in, out there who's watching this, if you're interested in looking at historical roots, you'd have to understand the context in which this uh, grew in. You'd have to take a look at the original source, translated sources by Blair and Robertson. Now, it's the most thorough compilation available. And while a lot of people, sometimes they felt that the two, Blair and Robertson made some You still get pretty much What did they find? Um, with regards to documentation in Cebuano history, the transmitters of this knowledge here, you know, you, you, the people get those, people didn't get. Why would we want to learn from the context? Okay. Understanding colonial history is a kind of a complex subject. How did the Spanish dominate the Philippines so easily? Well, not all of 
Prophet was done by our conquest with guns. Obviously, that's a big part there, but there was resistance and where the natives didn't like them. Okay, that's what. But how did they with trade? Making treaties, making agreements uh, with the local rulers, okay. entangling everybody in a set of commercial relationships. Now, why did Espanols uh, come in so quickly into our own um, languages, like in Tagalog and in Hiligaynon or Ilongo and in Bisaya, Cebuano? Why? Well, here's the part of the clue is by and comes from indirectly from the work of another historian friend of mine, Damon Woods, in his translation of the work of Thomas Pinpin. Okay. There are two early works in Espanol and Tagalog printed in the Philippines in their local languages, right? One was, of course, the Doctrina Cristiana, which is the a handbook for prayers and basic Catholic teaching. And it's a fascinating document. The U.S. The University of Santo Tomas published its replicas. It's in Tagalog. It's in the Baybayin and it's in Espanol, okay? The other one was a manual for Tagalogs who want to do business with the Spaniards. And in there, the, the, the pattern is conversational. So if you want to do, the introduction says, if you want to do business with the Spaniards, this is what you must do. This is the what you must, the basic phrases for business and the numbering system, and this is how they count things. Okay. So you can see how gradually language was also influenced by trade, by contact. People yeah. began to just use them. Not to mention the fact that the Spaniards did also two things. One, they put up a church, and two, they put up a school wherever they uh, decided they wanted to put in an administrative center. Oh, in Cebu, that yeah. happened a lot of times. See, so the influences come from multiple directions. Okay. In, in the documentation that they found concerning Cebu, there was an additional channel for the Spanish influence. And that was naturally since the Prailes were part of this year. For them, in their argument in their book was that the Prailes were also responsible for introducing the elements of Esgrima that would later on become the FMA in Cebu, the Esgrima of Cebu. Oh. Why, why was that? Because many of the frailes were themselves former military men. They entered the convent after doing their time for the king because they had enough of killing, they had enough of butchering, they had enough of warfare to oh, last them wow. a lifetime. That's news. So I they never knew that. Uh -huh. you, the, the book, I think, is still in print. Huh? Cebuano Escrima Behind the Myths. Um, it's published okay. by Ex Libris. Yeah? So I would recommend that too, because at least yeah. it focuses on Cebu, so this focus is very specific. It, it's not going to make a claim for generalization elsewhere, but when you read a book mm. and you take that into account, you could ask yourself some questions. So what would it have been like elsewhere where people spoke another language? For example, among the Tagalog-speaking areas up here in Luzon. For the Hiligaynon speaking areas, the, for the Ilongo culture down in Negros and in Panay, you know, what would it have been like for them? Could we find probable uh, document, similar documentation like that, probably from these translated documents? That would be a source of uh, fascination. That sure. would be a fascinating topic for research. You see, but going back to this, to this Ibuano Escriba. Uh, then why were they teaching the, Span the native swordsmanship? Okay? Yeah, why? Because obviously it didn't make sense for them to be colonizers teaching the natives how to use stuff against them. Because they had another common enemy at the time. And these were the Moro raiders who were coming out of southern Philippines oh. on a yearly cycle of raiding and trading. And the pattern would be to go up from one side then down the other side here. And that's why in many coastal towns in Luzon and in the Visayas, you will find a church that is so thick, built of very thick stones. Apparently, it doubled as an emergency bunker whenever a Moro raider came up. 
So, excuse me. Right? So the Moros yes. not only would go into the lower Negros area, but they would actually ship up to Luzon area as well? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, this is so fascinating. Okay. Oh, wow. We we call them now Moro. Well, the the ethnic groups that we call Bangsa Moro today. That's our term that we accepted now. No? The ethnic groups that comprise these Bangsa Moro raiders were uh, Tausug, Iranun, and Balangigi. These are Balangigi, I think. That's these are three uh, groups, and these were funded by funded yes funded by rich capitalists from the La Lake Lanao area. Now, part of it was trading, part of it was raiding for slaves and for food resources. Uh, again, for our readers, um, take a look at James Warren's trilogy on <clears throat> what they call the Sulu Zone. Right? Oh, yeah, I got to take this down. I'm sorry, James, James sure. Warren? James Warren. Warren, W A R R E N, and the Sulu Zone, right? Okay. So I, I'm. Wait, uh, the suit. I, I'm uh, sending you the title, and the one that's most uh, relevant to this part is not just the Sulu Zone because that describes the economic history in the area, but also this one. Iranun and Balangini. Wow, I'm gonna have to admit, if you don't yeah. mind, sure. Maestro, I'm gonna have to message you later sure. and get these names. Am, like, yeah. this is like too good. Uh, oh, can I just? I just so, want to take some time to some of the comments. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Sure. 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 Uh, Tom. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah like, uh, Marvin. <laughs> Mando, Marvin. Right, and extra cheese. <laughs> Interesting. Amazing. Vico, hey, yes, the British, yeah. Sounds like they were All right. Uh Richard hey, Pack, thank you. Daniel. All right. Uh, All right. Hi, Hi, Daniel. Right. right. And Lissandra. Sounds like she's your student. Yeah, oh, she's my student. student. Yeah, she's my student. All right. Hi. Shout out to all the TBB out there. <laughs> All right. Yeah, she's been wow. All right. And uh, I'm just want to make sure we got everybody. Oh, yeah, Vico. Uh, this is um this is just because, amazing. And, uh, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, Maurice, uh, oh, gosh, Marius, Terry, yeah. That's great. Yeah, it is a great interview. Thanks, this Terry. Is, yeah, thanks, Terry. This is amazing. And Marius will. Oh, I'm sending the titles to Dean. Yeah, Marius, I'll be sending the titles to Dean later, so oh, you could also I, see oh, about. I would, I would be so appreciative of that. This I just sure. find this stuff like. Actually, sometimes mm -hmm. more fascinating than like the physical techniques of a system. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. But you see where this is going? Because then, yeah, because then the the Bangsa Moro were a very complex set of kingdoms, okay, mm -hmm. with a complex trading relationships. And back then they had a close economic and cultural ties with several of the other kingdoms in what was used to be called Malaya, but even then, Malaya was more a British adapted term. But these were kingdoms in Sabah, down in Malaysia, all the way up to Indonesia. So the, but more closely connected to Malaysia, especially the Sabah area. Mm -hmm. Many of the royal families from Sulu and from Maguindanao on the Mindanao mainland, and even from the Yakan, my Silat Guru's family have distant relatives, distant family in Sabah. Okay. And that relationship with Sabah still continues even today. There's a Filipino community down in Sabah as well. Huh. Okay? In as much as there are some Malaysian migrants living in the Southern Philippines. So, you know, across the straits between the two, they are there's a constant interchange of people. So, going back to the context here, the raiders, um, part of the reason, why was there so much animosity between the Bangsamoro then and the Spaniards? Yeah, the part why? of it was the Spanish history. Um, remember, too, that when Fernando de Magalhaes, or Ferdinand Magellan, came here, he was given a commission by <coughs> the Spanish crown <coughs> to look for lands here. 
um, in the recent biography of Magellan, the Portuguese crown, because Magellan was a Portuguese uh, was a Portuguese um, explorer and mercenary. The Portuguese crown didn't like it because the Spain and Portugal were rivals. Okay, and uh, in okay in Spain, Magellan is a hero. In Portugal, the king ordered the confiscation of his property after he died. His children they renounced the name Magalhaes or his title because they were pretty much ashamed of their ancestor. That's a oh. very interesting part of biography. But why would the, the Spanish crown commission them? Because they needed more land and territory. They had been fighting off the uh i've forgotten which of the islamic empires was coming in into from southern spain from sevilla cordova uh especially andalusian area in the they call it now andalusia but the arabic name <clears throat> used to be al andalus right it had an arabic name many of the Spanish cities in southern Spain also had a uh, Spanish derived Arabic names actually. So you can imagine this. They were busy fending off the what, what whom they called the Moors, the Moros up those there. Moros, from the huh? south. Yeah. They called them Moors Mo Moros because those the bad, those are bad people. <laughs> <laughs> I have the one, ethnic groups. Yeah, sorry. I have one one question. Just um, here and um, sure. Marvin Mendoza, is there truth to the Spaniards having Filipino swordsmen on their galleons? And I think you for Mexico, correct? It's possible. All right. Oh, okay. We okay. need to find more documentation. And you know what? Uh, the best one would be if you trace the economic, go into economic history. But if you want to go into detail on that then you'd have to look for uh, lists, crew lists. Mm -hmm. They would have often trace, see, who's this guy and where is he from? Then you could figure out. Okay. All right. But I would caution you, uh, Marvin, that he wouldn't be called Filipino swordsman. Filipino was a term reserved for the Spaniards born in the Philippines. Instead, that would be listed as an Indio crewman. Okay? No. Wow. Indio. India. They would have listed India. Right? Huh. All right. This is amazing. So, so going back again to the Spanish yeah, the Moro yeah. Wars. Coming in from here, they encountered Moros again. So what was the first reaction of many of the Spanish uh uh the, the Spanish coming here? Hostility. Submit to us first. And what was the reaction of many of the indigenous uh, Muslim groups who were already Islamized here? One of them uh, wrote a letter to the Viceroy, Vice Royal, you know, saying, look, in essence, look, if you have a problem with our brothers in your part of the world, that's your problem. We don't have a problem with you. Why are you bringing your quarrels with them to us? Oh, okay. Okay. But the position of the Spanish crown and of the church was absolutely no deals. It's either they become uh, Catholicos or they become Moros. And so the aggressive push. And then the Moros say, okay, if that's how it's going to be, then that's how it's going to be. Mm. <laughs> There's an interesting set now of documentation. Ah, uh, yes. Another title I'd recommend would be from UP Press. Um, it's a title called The Islamic Far East, The Growth of Islam in Southeast Asia, especially in the oh, Philippines. Okay. okay. And part of what I just mentioned here is the translations of documents that occurs in the first part of that book. Now, you know, the, the, the rationale, therefore, for the growth of Eskrima was to equip the Indios with weaponry, with techniques, technology to fight off the rivals of Spain to domination here. And that would have been the Bangsamoro or the Muslim groups. Okay. So in effect, 
is one of the the things you know you have to wrap your heads around what was that the growth of Escrima started with Spaniards bringing their quarrels with the Moors from Europe to the Philippines. <laughs> I tell you, you know, if you didn't like touch upon this, yeah. I personally would have had no idea. Matter of fact, uh, Guru Vico says the men, yeah. the men from the Illustrissimo family were commissioned to defend the Batayan Island. Yes, I yeah, okay. I would be. Yeah, this one that he comments in here, when the south wind blows, that's the season of the Moro raids. Yes, that's true. When the wind blows up from the south, that means, okay, it's a season time. Here, um, in Cebu, you have all of these coastal forts, right? And given where the direction where the wind blows, Cebu was a natural target for the Moro raiders, given also it was an administrative center for by the Spaniards, then naturally it was a favorite target for raiding. Okay, the whole island. Huh? And I'm I wouldn't be surprised this one here because the Ilo system of family, somebody has to do an in-depth history of that family and connect it to the bigger economic history in Cebu. Bantayan, because that's the context in which the entire Ilo system or system developed. Cebu. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cebuan yeah. economic history, the history of the Ilo system of family, and the general economic history of the Philippines. We have to touch upon that because we always think, oh, look at this. You know, we want to, we want to take a look at FMA history. Oh, the history of these techniques, history techniques. Guys, there's more to history than just figuring out who taught what, because if you want to figure out who taught what, the list stops right there. But if you want to get the context, why did these techniques develop the way they did, then you have to look at the bigger picture. And that is not only the social cultural history, but the economic history. Because yes, Vico's point here is this one here, the two comments he made here. He says here, when the South with bloats, that's the indication of the season of the moral rates. That yeah. had an impact on economic uh, growth here in the, up here in the islands. Right. Wow. Thirty years ago, when I was doing my undergraduate training in anthropology, we were doing our research in an island in Magallanes Bay, in Sorsogon. That's the southernmost provinces in the island. We were doing as a fishing village and. It was in the middle of the Bay, right? On a good day, if the wind strike, I could move a little bit higher, and you'd soon be in the summer later area, right? Now, in the island where we did our research, there was a small hill, and then there were the our professor took us up there, and we found the remains of a structure there, flagstones. Apparently, there was another more complete structure up there. The place was called Binanderahan from the word bandera or bandila, flag. Now, the reason was it was called Binanderahan because the locals told us in their historical memories that time passed. When the Moro raids came up, okay, that place, that island, was actually an advanced lookout or post. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. So from the on the other side, they could see whether there were raiders coming in. Mm -hmm. When they do that, they would raise a flag, a red flag, indicating trouble. There was the 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 island was visible from the church in Magallanes town proper, and actually from the turret of the church, the belfry. So there was always a lookout station there. The moment the red flag goes up there he would sound the warning bell. And all the civilians drop what they do. They crowd yeah. into the shelter, and the men begin preparing for defend the village. Wow, not to make fun of this. Go down the other side and cross over. <laughs> but you know what it sounds like? It sounds like yeah. Lord of Rings, when the orcs are coming. <laughs> 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 yeah, except for the horn, they have a bell. You know. Yes, <laughs> Jeff Cruz, uh, Context of History. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, yeah, my God. So, so look, in essence, yes, in just in essence, what you're saying, which is all fascinating, by the way, you should write a book. Um, 
that <laughs> the Spanish really, again, trained the natives of the, the, the Filipinos, not again, for them to basically aid them in the fights against the war with the Moros. Is that fair? Because that's one perspective that should be examined because this is, uh, it's not comfortable, <laughs> but it should be examined because the extent to which the Spaniards recruited from the locals. Remember, why else would they? Yeah, see, except only because they needed them for somebody else and they were willing to pay them uh, quite well too. And look, that has an impact on the kind of eschema we have today. Why? Because if you're training uh, support troops, to beef up your own local forces, then you need to train them in large groups, which means you have to simplify the training process. And that's mm. why you have the numerado system. Uno, dos, so, izquierda, la, 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 left, uh, right, left, right. So, Uno, dos. Cinco, zero. If you were training, I, I lost you there. No, I guess what I wanted to know is some refer to Cinco Taro as like an abridged system. Five cuts. Yeah. Ah, uh, that one, I'm not so sure if that's a bridge system. Uh, let's see. Warm islands through smoke signals. That would depend on how close they were. Okay, okay. The smoke signals was possible if the islands were in close proximity to but each other. But they could see, okay, okay. Yeah, but they could see. Uh, that's one. The flag was possible because it was visible. So the visibility in the closest of the island was always uh, something to take into account. To dig and what that, they were to do. Okay. Yes. And, you know, that tells you something about the kind of strategic thinking and or defense defensive kind of thinking uh, that was going on in that era. Yeah. Right. yeah. You were asking me about the something about the yeah tom peña said the spaniards created a militia that's it they recruited militia thanks tom yeah. remember there are two r's when understanding this part of history recruitment is one okay it's militia and the people the recruitment and resistance and sometimes resistance came from those who were recruited Right. Okay. So that's something to think about because these are additional areas of inquiry we need to look into uh, looking at the history of Filipino martial arts. It's also right? fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, that, that affects us even today. And in our own local narratives, we tend to romanticize only a few bits and pieces of these uh, histories. Like, for example, Lapu-Lapu uh, Lapu and yeah, the yeah, duel with Magellan. That's a yeah. comic book cover. It's a beautiful story, but Pigafetta's account says otherwise. Yeah, uh, I find what you're saying so much more fascinating, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> and people should read some of these things in order to get a... I would recommend some books in you. Oh and, you know, they would get an idea. Well, look, is this the right time to show one of the books I was telling you about? Oh, please do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, for you guys... Uh, another title you could look at, I'll send Dean the list and then we would probably post it in the FMA. Oh my God, that'd be, it'd be my pleasure. It's out there, so uh, this academic sources. Here's one, a uh, posthumous publication. It's called Barangay by William Henry Scott, right? Now, this book is fascinating because um, one, look at how the natives are depicted here. Clothes. This is from the Boxer Codex, and the clothing, the cloth for their, the material for their clothes here, that's silk. Mm. Okay. So in contrast to the earlier depiction, this only a little part. This was the wear attire, especially among the, uh, what you call this? This would be have been upper class attire, right? And it makes sense in a tropical environment. It's loose, it's comfortable, it doesn't get you too hot, right? It's a posthumous work by Dr. William Henry Scott, and Professor Scott 
came up with this as a kind of a narrative view of the Spanish dictionaries, all right? Most of the terminologies here come from the Espanol, Espanol Visaya dictionaries compiled by the Frailes over a period of probably 16th to 18th centuries. Uh, Espanol to Tagalog, Espanol Kapampangan. Uh, let me check. The major chapters here cover the cover the Visayas, and then from Mindanao to Luzon, Bicol, Tagalog, Kapampangan. There's, there's the shorter chapters would be for Northern Luzon and Mindanao. Now, for all of you FMA dudes out there, check out this table of contents, uh, chapter eight. Take a look at the title. If you could see this, the title for chapter eight, Weaponry and Warfare. Oh, okay. Right? Jeff Crew said he read it. He said it, it was describes fantastic. here on sea and on land. And we're not losing on controversial. I'm losing your audio here. Um, can you say part three? Yeah, I can. You know what? This is about the time last time. Okay, it looks like you're back. Uh -oh. oh, there you go. Dean, I'm losing. Wait, I'm, I'm losing your. I can't hear and see you. Here. Uh oh. Oh, no. Please, no, don't disappear. <laughs> I, oh, my God, this would happen. This was around the time last time this kind of happened. Uh, can you uh, hear me? Maestro, I can see and hear you. Uh, Hello, me? I can hear you, yeah. Oh man, this would stink. This... That would be a good excuse for a part three. Dean, I'm losing your audio here. Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? No, oh, no, I was just, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello. Uh, Maestro, can you hear me? D. Uh oh. Now we have problems. Snap again. Yeah, you can't hear me. <laughs> oh no. Uh, we might have. Um, oh man. Um, I could definitely. I'm hearing you and seeing you. You can't hear me. Uh, Maestro, we may have to unfortunately cut this and welcome a part three Hello. because D? It's about okay. to, yeah. Uh -huh. Can you hear me? Oh no, we lost the connection. Okay. Nothing, Maestro. Uh, okay. I'm trying to come back in. You're, yeah, you're in. I'm just thinking why you can't hear me. Um, Oh, uh, yeah, there's definitely Tom. I, this kind of happened last time. Um, around this time, actually last Tuesday, we're, we kind of lost them. And I'm thinking maybe because more people just come on um, come on internet is, is my guess. But I just sent him a message for a part three because I didn't get to the questions and, and I just don't want people to think I'm not paying attention to that. It's just that he gets going and that the content is just so incredible. Wow. Cool. Um, are you back? Yep, I'm back. Oh, right. You know, Maestro, we got to- um, Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Sure, yeah. Can you hear me? Mm. 
Yeah, we're gonna have to just do that. Oh boy, what a shame. Um, all right, folks. Yeah, I'm gonna unfortunately have to cut this out regrettably, um, not by choice. Um, yeah, that was uh, incredible. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna see if he can basically next Tuesday, because I have somebody um, Thursday, if he can uh, come aboard. And what I'm gonna try to do then, just in fairness to people who submitted questions, Daniel, and Julius, I definitely want to get your questions. I think Julius submitted like two or three. Daniel had one question. Um, if anybody has any more questions between now and then, I mean, please feel free to submit. I will definitely, uh, you know, we'll get those. Uh, my plan was to definitely get those questions uh, from people who submitted. But, you know, when he takes off, this information is just like so good. So I don't want to like stop him and say, hey, wait, we got questions. Um, because it's just so informative. I mean, there is so much I learned tonight. Uh, somebody's going to be sending me the list of those books, and by all means, I will definitely post them here. Uh, Jeff, Guru Jeff read one. He said it was fantastic. Uh, so I'm, I'm assuming the other ones uh, sound are going to be incredible as well as far as history and all that. But I, I just can't believe some of the stuff he was saying. It's just incredible. For now, on, if I have any question about history, I'm like going to him. Uh, Yes, I absolutely, Marge. I will definitely not forget the titles. Yes, thank you. This Thursday, we have, you know, he's not an FM mayor. He's somebody I have, uh, I really admire what he's done. Um, his name is uh, Nick Drozos. He's out of Canada. And basically what he's done is uh, he's gone out and done experiments. So basically go in a park, hey, attack me with a knife. And me and him have come to similar conclusions with two on one. And um, again, non FM mayor per se, but I think his context and what he's doing is relevant. And I, I just like his approach. I like his honesty and combat, realistic combat, and especially with the knife. Um, so that's this Thursday and all that. But I'll, I'll put his fly out at eight o'clock and what have you. But all those who watch, you know, thank you so much. Um, this this was fantastic. There will be a part three for the questions. Um, Maestro just. Uh, said sure so it, that's obviously very nice of him to come back for part three i'll just be sure just to go right to the questions um and all that but again if you have not hit like and subscribe to uh, fma discussion on youtube and i will all see you guys uh, uh thursday uh thank you for watching and uh chiming in